Thomas Chapel. We're glad that you're listening in, and we appreciate those that are here. Pray that the Lord will bless this service and uh, the songs and the message, and ask that you would share the word. Try to get out the message. Help us get out the message so others can know about the Wilderness Broadcast. And so at this time, we're going to pray and ask the Lord to bless this time together. Father, we just thank you for this day. Pray that you bless this broadcast. Pray that you bless the service. And we that are here and those that listen in, pray that you minister to every need. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Mark's going to come and lead us in the song. Jesus Never Fails, page 101. <laughs>
Everlasting Arms, page 147. Peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting. 
Great music. Enjoyed that a lot. Praise the Lord. At this time, let's take your Bible and turn to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2. Look at verse number 22. Concerning the uh, dedication of children to the Lord. We're looking at Jesus, in verse 22, And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This is Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So this is a separated holy child. And then notice, as it is written in the law, so God put that in his word to do so. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So it gives you an indication Mary and Joseph didn't have a lot of money, but they gave their best. And that's what we need to do, give our best. Amen. So hear ye the master's call, give me thy best. Amen. Now, Turn to Judges chapter 13, and we read about an, another couple who gave what they had because God wanted what they had. He wanted them to give their child to him. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and so verse 3 says and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her behold now thou art barren and bearest not but thou shalt conceive and bear a son now therefore beware I pray thee and drink not wine nor strong drink and eat not any unclean thing for lo Thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And so here is an example of the dedication of a child. And first of all, it takes desire. Okay, so that's the first point. It takes desire. And uh, we find that here's a woman that was barren. Okay, so she wanted a child. And... Uh, it may take a miracle. Uh, it started with this woman. She was barren. But she needed a miracle to have a baby. And so we find that in verse 3. The angel of the Lord appeared. And this took a miracle for God to intervene in this situation. And it takes sacrifice. It takes sacrifice. We're talking about the dedication of a child to God. Amen. It takes sacrifice. In verse number four, God told her, Therefore neither drink wine or strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Okay, so this took sacrifice and depriving herself of these things that she could have had. And then notice, it takes separation. It takes separation. Look at verse five. Thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite. That took separation. The child shall be a Nazarite. So they needed to adjust their lives to a life of separation. This took some adjustment. That's right. Okay? And they raised their child as a separated, dedicated child. Okay? That's what they did. And this is a dedication of a child way back in the time of the judges, long, long time ago. But we have this in the Bible to teach us some things. Right. And so the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Okay? And so it takes both parents. We find that in verse number 12. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall note it? This word. We, see that word we, order the child. And we're talking about the dedication of a child to the Lord. That's what that's we're right. talking about. Now that, that's a choice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we can choose to do this or not choose to do it. But here, it said, how shall we do it? 
So it was a joint proposition. Father and mother. Dedicating a child to the Lord. And uh, the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And it took both parents. He said, how shall we order the child? How are we going to do this? And uh, God said, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. So, the husband needed to, to allow this dedication to occur God's way. Okay? And uh, it takes God's blessing. It takes God's blessing. If we're going to dedicate a child, we need the Lord to receive that child that we've dedicated to the Lord. And the woman, verse 24, bare a son and called his name Samuel, and the child grew, and what? The Lord blessed him. So it took a blessing from the Lord. And so this is what it took, the dedication of a child. So we too can dedicate our children. Amen. We can do that. That's your choice. But we can do it. And we find another example in 1 Samuel chapter 1. So just turn over a few pages. 1 Samuel chapter 1. And again, we, we've got the desire. Here's Hannah. She cannot have a child. She had no children. Verse 2. It took dedication. It says, she vowed a vow. That's verse number 11. It took separation. In verse 11, it says, no razor to come upon his head. So this is a child that's being separated and dedicated. And it took uh, negotiation. Look at verse number 11. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, I will give him unto the Lord. Notice, all the days of his life. See that? Mm -hmm. Now that took some negotiation. She said, Lord, if you'll give him, I'll give him to you. I'll dedicate him to you. I'll I'll do this. And and it look, it took sacrifice. This takes sacrifice. Listen, we're not gonna have this without some sacrifice. It took sacrifice. Uh, no razor to come upon his head. Why don't you cut your child's hair? You know, today it's like, why do you do you cut their hair? But back then it's why do you cut your child's hair? Why are they so dedicated? Why are they so separated? Well, I dedicated them to the Lord. Well, why'd you do that? Well, I made a, a, an agreement with the Lord. I, I told the Lord, if you'll give this child, I'll give him to you. Amen. So I've dedicated Samuel to the Lord. And so um, it, this took sacrifice. Look at verse 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Rome. So here's two people and they're dedicated themselves and they're separated and they have sacrifice in that they're rising up early and worshipping. So that shows what? Priority. The Lord was their priority. And... Uh, Notice verse 21. Look at verse 21 of chapter number 1. It says, And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord, what? The yearly sacrifice. So they were always doing what God wanted, wanted them to do. And notice the, these words, his vow. So here's her vow, and here's his vow. So you got them both. Amen. 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 So here is the sacrifice that it takes to raise a godly seed. This is what it takes. And so it took desire, dedication, separation, 
sacrifice of both parents. It wasn't just one. So she's making vows. Well, where'd she learn? Well, he's making vows. You understand? And by the way, when she brought Samuel to the temple, she brought three bullocks and an ephah of flour. Now, you, when you grind your own flour and you think about a half a bushel basket or a bushel basket of ground flour, and you hand ground, that's a sacrifice. And then, not only that, three bullocks and, and an ephah of flour and a bottle of wine. And so it, it's a lot, of, a lot of work to that. Getting that, them grapes and, you know, it's not just a bushel basket, basket of grapes. This is the pressed grapes. That's hard to get back then. This is their best. This is their best. And so this is what it took to dedicate a child. And so this is what it means to train up a child. Now I want you to get this part. Get this part. We, we always get to train up a child. But wait a minute. In the way he should go. Okay? Did you get that part? So, that has to do with parental influence. Okay? It's not saying, now Samson, what would you like to do? No, it was Samson. We dedicated you. It wasn't Samuel. Samuel, you, you want to be a fireman or you want to be a, a rocket scientist or you want to be a doctor? No, it's Samuel. We've dedicated you to God. We've given your life to God. You need to fulfill the course that you were born to fulfill. You understand? Yes. Right? The world's got it all messed up. This is what God's way of doing things. You understand? Amen. And it takes desire. It takes dedication, it takes separation, it takes sacrifice, and it takes cooperation. Both parents need to be willing to give their self and their children. And so here's two sacrificial lives. Here's two people that, that are accustomed to serving the Lord. And uh, here's a Lady can't have a baby making an agreement and uh, negotiating with the Lord about having a child and dedicating a child. And so, train up a child in the way he should go. Just stop there. Just listen to that. It, it's not, it's saying, you do the job in the way he should go. Look, the person that shoots the arrow has to hone that arrow before he shoots it in the bow. God has given us this great responsibility called parenthood. Okay? And it's not going to come easy for the next generation. Actually, actually, it's becoming harder and harder. But it was hard in Samuel's day. We're going to look at Eli's sons that Samuel was raised up learning from. Okay? What kind of dedication did they have? Well, it wasn't much. And so, this is the God-given influence of parents. Ephesians chapter 6. Just turn over there. Ephesians chapter 6. And look at verse 4. <clears throat> and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. Now look at those words. Bring them up. That's, that's our responsibility. Bring them up. That's dads. That's not the children bringing up their self. Bringing, bring them up. How? God tells them in the nurture. And admonition of the Lord. So, dedicating our children to the Lord isn't just going to the altar and saying, Lord, here's my child. It's entering into the whole process. That's right. 
Okay? And so, people that raise a godly family must do so at great cost. It, it's not... Look, three bullocks aren't cheap. Okay? A nymph of flour probably took her a week to grind. It didn't come easy. Those bullocks, they're not cheap. You... Look, 2,000 2, pounds on the hoof. I mean, that's reasonable to say for a bull ox. You're looking at, at, at today's prices, six bucks a pound, let's say five dollars a pound for uh, 2,000 pounds. No, what is that? That is $10,000. That's a pretty good gift, isn't it? It comes at a cost. To raise a child. Amen. It's not cheap. But to dedicate the child, it's more. You're not just putting shoes on their feet and, uh, you know, a rattle in their hand. You're, you, th there's a cost to serving the Lord and dedicating a child. And so, it requires desire and dedication. And we need God's wisdom. Turn to Matthew chapter 2. It's interesting that all these women are barren and they, they can't have kids and then they're dedicating their kids. Matthew chapter number 2, look at verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And so, what's this? This is a sacrifice. He's uprooting his life. He's going to a strange place. His wife is following him. And it's all about the preservation of the child. In other words, it's not about the nice house. It's not about the settled life. It's not about all the neighbors and friends that we know. It's about... Taking a child to a new life in a hard place where you're pretty much all alone, it's Egypt. You think they acclimated to Egypt? No, this is an isolated life. For what? The preservation of the child. Do you understand? It didn't come easy, it was a sacrifice. And God said, look at verse 13. Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee into Egypt, be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And so the devil is out to destroy your child. That's right. And if you want them to survive this thing, you're going to have to pay a price. And that price isn't going to come in compromise. It's not going to come in compromise. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he made the battle. At this time, it was Jesus and Mary and Joseph. And so, Revelation 12, verse 17 says the dragon was wroth with the woman. You know what? The devil's very angry at these children. The seed of Israel. seed of Abraham. By promise. And went to make war with the remnant. See how much the devil loves children? He's declared war on your kids. He's declared war on mine. My children. To make war with the the remnant of the seed, which what? Keep the commandments of God. So, the more dedicated you are, the more dedicated the devil is to destroy him. That's what he wants to do. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so the devil is like a roaring lion. He's got a goal in mind. Now go to Luke chapter 1. Very interesting. How many barren people dedicated their children? And uh, 
We've got Zacharias and Elizabeth. Luke chapter 1. And notice, they were dedicated. They were separated. And uh, they were living sacrificial lives. Look at verse 6. They were righteous before God and blameless. And verse 13 of chapter 1, God said, Thy prayer is heard. Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. So here's a man that prayed for years and years and years for a child. And I'm sure he devoted that child to God. And God, if you'll give me a child. In this case, it looks like it was the prayer of Zacharias that God's listening to. I'm sure it was both of them. But God said, thy prayer is heard. I'm going to give you a son. So what a blessing to get a child from God. And so the miracle takes place. And uh, look at verse 15. There was sacrifice involved. Verse 15. It says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. Now notice, all of them were living sacrificial lives. They were living separated lives. They're not going to live like the ordinary kids. They're sacrificing. And notice this. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Took sacrifice. And notice the usefulness of all these children. You dedicate them, and God gives them usefulness. Listen, the best life isn't them choosing their own, own path. The best life is them choosing God's path, and we need to encourage them to Amen. do that. Amen. And so he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And so getting fathers to dedicate their children. I mean, that's the way he was raised, John the Baptist. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And so, 2 Timothy 3.15, God said concerning Timothy, Paul brought these words. From a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture. This took some dedication on Timothy's, at least his mother's part. Because um, we know that his mother and grandmother had a great impact on his life. Timothy in the, in the New Testament. It took some dedication. Now what, it, what do you have? Usefulness. Timothy's being used to God. Amen. What a blessing. Right. Amen. And so how long should a parent use their influence with their children? That's the next step. How long should that go on? As long as they can. Okay, before they're born, and after they're born, and after they grow up. As long as you've got breath and life and influence, we need to use it. Why? Well, because the Lord's a great king and we should serve him. And so Joshua said... As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He didn't say, what do you guys want to do today? You want to serve the Lord or not? He said, we're going to do this. And we need to make up our mind and serve Jesus. No matter what's going on. Now, keep in mind, Hannah lived in the days of Eli. Eli lived in a very apostate hour. And uh, she vowed. She did. She was part of this yearly sacrifice. She weaned this child. She brought him to the house of God. She lent him to the Lord. She gave her child to the Lord. And the environment wasn't very good. Yes. And uh, Eli's sons, if you'll go back to 1 Samuel chapter 1, coming to a close here. 
Eli's sons were sons of Belial. So they didn't really fear the Lord. I don't know if Eli failed to dedicate his children and they abhorred the offering. So we find that he was not the best example. And it says, Thou honorest thy sons above me. So apparently they got their way. These boys got their way. Instead of the Lord having his way with them, they had their way. He gave them that choice. You know, that also happened with uh, Samson. He said, now son, it's not best for you to marry a Philistine. But he went ahead and persuaded his parents. And uh, it didn't turn out all that well. He was a Nazarite. Samson was a Nazarite. And uh, he told this harlot how to cut his hair. And it cost him his life and his honor. So, Eli's sons, they were sons of Belial. And God said in chapter 2, verse 29, He said, Thou honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the cheapest of all the offerings. So Eli was very intemperate. Listen, temperance needs to be retaught to our children. Right. <clears throat> yes. We need temperance. Get up, pray, fast sometimes. We don't have to have all these things that we want. Deprive ourselves of things on purpose. It's called temperance. And... Uh, his sons made themselves vile. And notice in verse 13, he restrained them not. So here's adult boys. And here's a preacher daddy. And he's not telling them what they're doing is wrong. He restrained them not. Apparently he had the power to do so and he should have used it. Authority and influence. I want you to look at chapter 2, verse 22. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the woman that assembled at the door. Well, that's a common thing happening in today's churches. And notice, of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he said unto them, why do you such things? For I hear of your evil doings by all this people. Why are you doing this? He should have said, you better not do that. I'll pull your beard out. I, I don't know what he should have said. I mean, he should have done something because it says, Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. And so... This was a major sin. But look what it says. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto the voice of their father. So here's a man who's, who's, who's trying his best, I guess, to negotiate with them, but they didn't listen. And here's what it cost them. A whole generation. Now that's a big cost. So here's a man not filling his role. Here's children not listening to their dad. And by the way, they're not little kids. They're priests. They're 30 years old. And, and they're not listening. They're at least 30. We're probably close to 40, 45 or something like that. Listen, I remember Maximum George. He came to our house. He was an old judge. And his kids, he called them his kids. One of them's a school teacher, and the other, I think, was an engineer. And I think they're like, they're both retirees. And they're standing at the door at the apartment, and he said, These are my kids. He said, Your kids. <laughs> Big, motley looking guys, you know, already lived their life, raised their families. These are my kids. Like, Oh, hi, how you doing, sir? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just a kid. These guys. <clears throat> but anyway. But they respected their father. 
They were out there with their dad on a vacation. I don't know what they were doing. But you could tell there was a respect for Maximum George. And you know what Maximum George, he said he, he was a judge. And he would take people in his back office and he'd talk to them about the Lord when he would give his judgment and he would try to encourage them to turn to the Lord. Amen. He did that. I think before his judgment, maybe after, but I think it was even before. And so, this is where we need a revival today. And this gives you the, the backdrop of Malachi chapter 4. So let's look there for just a moment. Remember, a generation was lost. Why? A father that didn't restrain his children. And children that didn't listen to their father. Listen, God wiped out Eli's generation. You follow it down. And here's John the Baptist, and he was a dedicated child. And he's preaching this message. The same one that was found in Malachi 4. You hear that from John the Baptist in the book of Luke. Where it says, He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, Malachi 4, 6, and the heart of the children to the fathers. Now look at this. God says, Lest I smite the earth with curse. This is something we need to restore on planet earth. Or we're going to see the earth eliminated. Just like Eli's generation. The whole earth. This is something that's, that's missing. This is what we this is why our culture is the way it is today. This is the whole package. And so God reset this when John the Baptist came. This this very truth. Reset. It says turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, lest I come and smite the earth, earth with a curse. And so, it, what's it going to take? Number one, desire. Somebody's going to have to want this. Look, I dedicated my family before I was even married. I did before I was married. I said, Lord, you if you'll give me a wife, I'll raise a family for you. <laughs> And then Amy comes along and she says, I can't have any kids. Or I don't know that I'm going to have any. No way. I can't do that. And then I got more information, you know, and it's like it was a fear, you know, because there were barren people in her family. She was concerned it might happen to her. But you have proven them wrong, dear. Okay. And so it's going to take desire. It's going to take dedication. It's going to take separation. Hyper-separation. You say, what's that for? Because corruption will take place if we don't. You see, <clears throat> there may be a good tree here, and there may be a corrupt tree there, and there's one right between the two. And the corruption of this tree is going to take a, a little while to get through that tree to this tree, but it will get through They'll get through. You go to the medical field, you go to the food industry, you go to anything that has to do with quality control, and everyone has this thing called separation. I mean, if we have a chicken virus, they'll wipe out millions of chickens because of corruption. And it will wipe out the whole industry. Well, see, God has this mandate. And if we don't get it right, it's going to wipe out the whole world. And so, it's going to take separation. It's going to take sacrifice. Look at that child. You don't let him drink wine. He doesn't drink strong drink. You know, recently somebody wrote me and was telling me how they believe it's okay to drink wine. And I wrote them back. I said, someone said, it's not the social drinker that has the problem. It's the kid that sucks out, the suds out of the bottle that 
becomes the alcoholic. And so it's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take both parents' concentration and their, their consecration to raise a godly seed. It's just that's what it's going to take. To use all your influence, you can. And uh, it's possible that you might in this generation raise a godly seed. It's possible. But I'll tell you what, without radical effort, you're probably not going to do it. So this culture is getting worse and worse. It's getting, but it was bad in Samuel's day, and God raised up one of the most renowned prophets that we have in the Bible. It was in John's day. It was bad. They that sat in darkness saw great light. It was dark. We think, it, you know, it, oh, it was so wonderful because, you know, all the people were so friendly and happy, and, you know, Jesus' day, it was so good. No, no. It was bad. There's demonics everywhere. There was just oppression and sickness and and mental illness and all kinds of things. Yeah. Theft and murder and you know, look at Herod. I mean, the government was corrupt. It was bad. There was a reset. And so um, things are getting bad these days. All right, so I, I brought what I believe the Lord wanted me to bring. I hope it's a blessing. Yeah. And uh, challenge us. Amen? Challenge our faith. You know, there's a good word that John used. It's a good word. You know what that word is? It's called repent. Change your mind. That's the beginning. The change in our way. And getting on the path. And uh, using whatever you got, you know, Billy Sunday, he, he said he'd fight the devil, and when he teeth falls out, he'll gum him. he fight the devil before he dies. But Billy Sunday lost his own child. He said, I've won, the, I've won the world, he told his wife, but I've lost my son. Well, take sacrifice. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Pray that you bless uh, this time. Pray that you bless this lesson. We commit it to you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Page 308. Surrender all. Page 308.